with me, Mary Janet Lee. This month at the Early Music Shop, we're celebrating the recorder with Recorder 31. And if you haven't checked out uh, our website yet, um, you can get daily recorder updates, performances, competitions, special offers. It's absolutely brilliant. And this week has been all about the bass recorder. Uh, but of course, now we're moving into soprano week. So today I'll be taking you through the history of the soprano recorder and finding out how many soprano recorders I have in my house. So many of us uh, in Europe started to play the recorder in school with one of these. Uh, this plastic recorder is by Yamaha, but I think a lot of people my age, um, in the UK at least, started with an Aulos plastic recorder. Um, it rather depends on your age and country, but I started class recorder at school in our class music lesson. Um, unfortunately, class music and music and education in schools is under threat here in the UK. Um, but uh, I have really fond memories of class music. Um, but of course, class recorder playing isn't necessarily the most beautiful sound in the world. Um, and it has been responsible for quite a lot of the recorder's um, negative publicity in recent years. Uh, but I wasn't put off somehow, um, and uh, I progressed very quickly in class recorder. And my father, who's a musician as well, um, composed some harder parts for me to play with the rest of the class. And the rest is history. But to get back to the very beginning of the soprano recorder's history, we have to look back to the Middle Ages, maybe the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. And there are various examples surviving, um, for example, one excavated in 1940 in Dordrecht in the Netherlands. Um, but these are very few and far between, um, and in fact there's no surviving notated music um, for the soprano recorder, or indeed any other recorder, before around 1500. The first solo style uh, soprano recorder I have here is the Ganassi recorder. Um, and this one is made by Lee Virgi. This instrument tries to recreate the fingerings found in uh, Silvestre Ganassi's La Fonte Gara, a very useful treatise for recorder players, which we'll come back to in a couple of weeks. And although this recorder is loosely based on a historical model, actually most sopranos during the 16th century would have been made as part of a recorder consort or a group of recorders. Um, it's quite possible that the idea of a sort of solo recorder, um, at least a soprano recorder, would not really have been a thing at this point. Um, nowadays, though, lots of professional recorder players will have a Ganassi-style model. Um, they've been developed to have a very powerful sound um, and particularly strong low notes, um, which is really wonderful to play um, in comparison with later recorder styles. Now, during the 17th century, the recorder changed a little, quite gradually, and in different places and different speeds, I think. And recorder players um, started to play a little bit more solo repertoire. Recorder makers have actually used various different historical models from the 17th century to produce what they call as transitional recorders. Um, and these soprano recorders have a much wider range um, and they have fingerings which are somewhere between a Ganassi style instrument, which of course are, are almost a, a whole new uh, fingering system to learn, and the Baroque soprano, which we know very well. My recorder here is made by Doris Colossa and it's based on an anonymous Italian instrument from the mid uh, second half of the 17th century. Uh, you can see it's rather thinner. Um, and rather straighter than my Ganassi instrument. Um, and if you look at the ends, um, the Ganassi has a wider bore at the end um, and the transitional recorder, this one here, is slightly narrower. Um, the transitional recorder is brilliant for playing Jakob van Eyck. Um, it's got a much wider range, easily reaching top C, which is very useful. Um, and so it's uh, can do a whole load of things that you couldn't do on a Ganassi concert style recorder of the 16th century. Um, you could also use it for playing late 17th century um, uh, Stilus Fantasticus music by Castello, by Pandolfo Miali, um, for Scabaldi, these kind of things. So this is a very useful recorder, the transitional. Then towards the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century, the recorder settled into the style which we now call the Baroque style. I have two Baroque sopranos here. 
one at 415 pitch by Takiyama and the other one at A440 by Molinar. Um, this one's a Denner in Palisander, and these are, they're both from the early music shop actually. Um, this was the first recorder I ever bought, the first wooden recorder, and I actually got the Takayama a couple of years ago. Um, as you can see, both of these instruments are now in three parts rather than two, and the bore is completely straight with only a small hole at the end. Um, but of course, the range is much higher, the tone is quite different, quite uh, much narrower, um, perhaps a little brighter depending on the wood you choose. Now there actually isn't a great deal of original repertoire for the Baroque recorder during the 18th century, um, as really the alto was the main instrument um, that people wrote for at that time. However, um, uh, the recorder was used as an obbligato instrument. Um, often small recorders were used um, to create the sound of birds, for example, and to add to a pastoral theme in a, in a piece or a cantata, for example. Um, but there are also a few solo pieces, um, for example, the concerto in F major by Sarratini, which some of you will know very well. And then, of course, a few more English concertos by people such as uh, William Babel. Um, although technically, his concertos were composed for a sixth flute, or a soprano recorder in D, just one tone higher. Now we know that the recorder was overtaken as an instrument by the transverse flute during this 18th century. And over the last part of the 18th century, it gradually died out. However, um, there were similar instruments, uh, various different kinds of duct flutes, um, which persisted into the 19th century. Um, for example, this instrument here, the chakan. This wasn't a recorder as such, and you can see it looks really quite different from a recorder. Um, however, the fingering is very similar to a soprano recorder, um, but there are some differences. So, as you can see, it's very long and thin. It's actually um, in A flat rather than C, and at the top it has a sort of straight mouthpiece as opposed to a uh, curved one that we're used to with the recorder. Um, it also feels rather difficult, uh, well it is difficult to play, but it's also quite different to play. Um, you can't just blow to produce more sound, it will quite quickly overblow, and um, it's a very soft instrument. Uh, so uh, what it feels very different to play, and something that's very interesting is that um, it is much easier to play kind of fast and flashy ornamentation on it, um, as you might have done in the early 19th century style. It has a very smooth and beautiful tone, so it was an instrument very much for playing in the home rather than in a concert hall. Um, you might have heard some of the virtuosic music composed for the Chakan, um, performed by a recorder players such as Piers Adams and Michaela Petri. Um, the uh, Ernst Kramer um, variations brilliantes are particularly exciting. I used to play these as a child. Um, they were one of my showpieces for competitions. Um, and they're often played on the soprano recorder today, uh, rather than just on the Chakan itself. But of course, uh, the soprano hasn't stopped developing. Uh, we have more modern sopranos, for example, the uh, Ganassi Eagle soprano uh, made by Adriana Broikink, and also a Molinar modern soprano. And these ones are uh, instruments are developed um, in order to have a more powerful sound, um, more options, more tone colours, in order to uh, perhaps carry over a modern orchestra or chamber ensemble with. Uh, the kind of more uh, basically louder modern instruments. Um, so I'm sure we won't see uh, the development of the soprano recorder stop anytime soon. So time for some music. Today I'm actually going to be playing a piece on the Chaka by the most prolific composer for the instrument, Anton Heberl. He actually probably invented the instrument, um, which in some versions can actually be used as a walking stick uh, it can be sort of extended um, with a stick and then sort of whipped out at a moment's notice. We know very little about Anton Haberl, uh, but he seems to have been uh, in Vienna in around 1807, 1811, then moving to Hungary after that. Um, and he wrote a huge amount of music for this instrument. Um, what I'm going to play now is the first movement of a sonata by Haberl, um, which he was published in Vienna in 1808. I used to play this on the soprano recorder as a child, but
But now I do have a check out, which I bought relatively recently from Bernard Molinar. Um, so I have recorded this on this instrument at St Mary Le Beau Church in Cheapside, London. for joining me today. In two weeks time it will be tenor a week and we're going to be uh, looking at how to write our own divisions. Don't forget to check out the Early Music Shop website for all the special offers um, associated with the recorder month and I will see you in a couple of weeks time. Bye bye! <laughs>